Great relationships don't just happen. If you want one, you've got to make it yourself. But how do you do that when you didn't have the models and examples that you needed? Some of us were lucky enough to have seen one or two solid marriages growing up. But that's not really enough since what worked for them isn't necessarily going to work for you. And lots of us just started doing marriage and love and relationships the way we thought was expected. Only to find ourselves in a love story that's, I don't know, okay, I guess? There's no right one right way to do love. That's good news. You can let go of all that old baggage and craft a marriage or partnership or chosen family or polycule or whatever that is so much more than okay. It's really the creation of a life that finally feels like home. At least that's what doing this has felt like for me. Me too. And getting here wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for us. We learned the hard way, the very hard way, that love is a verb. And the actions of love don't just come naturally. We all need skills and tools and support to do this well. And that's completely normal. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton, research psychologist and ASEC certified sexuality educator. I'll be sharing personal stories, evidence-based research, and case studies from my work as a relationship coach. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Um, I'm a human doing my best to make relationships my biggest priority in life. We're going to dig deep and offer vulnerable conversations between us as we keep learning how to customize our love and keep growing as individuals. As individuals. As individuals. And as a couple. And as a moresome. It's all very interesting. And we're also going to have some amazing, nuanced conversations with experts who can help you learn more ways to design the life you want. And if you find yourself saying at any point, damn, I really needed to hear that while you're listening, I would love it, we would love it, if you would head over and give us a quick rate and review on iTunes. It really does help other people find us, and we'd be so grateful for that. Now, it's time to reimagine your relationship from the ground up. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. There's no one right way to design your relationship. And lots of people, actually about 25%, according to a recent national survey, are interested in some type of open relationship. But how do you know if you are ready to open up happily? Not everyone is, and that's no problem. I've got a 60 second quiz that will give you the answer. And even better, you'll walk away with your next step, whether you're good to go or not so much when it comes to opening up. And this is no Buzzfeed nonsense. I personally designed this quiz from my years of academic research. Go to joliquiz.com. That's J-O-L-I-Q-U-I-Z.com and find out if you're ready to open up happily and what to do if you are or if you're not. Hey, um, this is our first tent recorded podcast episode. I'm looking at a tree. (laughs) Okay, so this isn't a whole episode of tent time because we have a really fantastic uh, guest for everybody today. Okay, we already recorded this interview. So this is just Ken and I preambling a little bit to prep you for the awesome sauce you are about to hear, um, we had the delightful ASECT um, certified sex educator, L Stanger, with us. And L is really not like anyone else. So we could have talked about a lot of different things with L. But what we're talking about is stuff that you might not expect us to talk about. We're going to talk about sex work. We're going to talk about sex work uh, in yeah, sex work as in a in a bunch of different yeah, ways. From a bunch of different and it's interesting. The timing of this is interesting because the movie Good Luck Leo, Leo Grand just came out, and I feel like there's an, an increased yep. amount of talk about what sex work actually is and normalization of it. And Ken and I had wanted to have L on the show for a bit, for a minute, and um, the timing is such that I feel like our audience might be a little bit better prepped right yeah, now. Yeah, that's right. For just having a conversation about, yeah, what sex work is, why it matters that we talk about it, um, why we get clear on what sex workers um, could use for help and what they need us to butt the hell out of. (laughs) 
Yeah. And Elle also did a great job of, um, well, helping us with a really fun topic. Because we talked about... Visiting, how, a strip, visiting a strip club. How to visit yeah. a strip club the classy way. <laughs> how, to, how to be a good patron of a strip club. Right. And the reason... Well, I mean, you can talk to the... You can speak to this maybe better than I, but I wanted to talk about it because every time I've gone... I've noticed that even though I am very comfortable in uncomfortable situations and uncomfortable conversations, I feel a little dumbfounded. Like I want to make sure that I'm, I'm showing up well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not always easy to know what to do and times change and clubs are different, but yeah, I just want to know that I can do it well because I don't want to be a jerk (laughs) and I want to have fun. So we had that conversation. Yeah, we want to. We want to have fun and not be a jerk and let the, the, the workers themselves have a good experience of us being there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a job. It's a job. It's a job. I like to, uh, yeah. Uh, it, it took me a little while as a professional, but I discovered that if I make the people around me happy, everything goes better. It took me a little while because patriarchal training and all that kind of crap. But... Making the people around me happier makes life better, gives me a better experience, gives them a better experience. So we go into the um, strip club and let's make people happy. Right. It's not all about us, no, actually. It's no, about it being in, it's always about being in your context. Yes. And I think it's and important. Being in relation to the Let, people. Yeah, let's live. name this. Um, the customer isn't always right. The I've worked retail. It's not always right. <laughs> no. True. And, and that's normal. So I think why I wanted to talk about that is because I know I want to be a good customer. I believe yes. that sex work is work. All of it. Everything from stripping to sex surrogacy to, to oh my goodness, all kinds of erotic labor. Erotic labor. Erotic labor. It's, <laughs> it's just work. It's work. And, and, and the people doing it deserve respect and care and, and to be... It, yeah, it's what I said before about being in relation with them and right. that recognizing them as people instead of just service providers. Well, worse than service providers. Uh, a lot of people. Yeah. And this has hap- this happened to me. The first time I was in a strip club, I was in my early 20s, and I didn't know what I was in for. But, in fact, it was the first time I'd been touched by a woman in a, a long time in an erotic way. And, and she touched me. Um, I was getting a private dance, and um, I was pregnant, and um, I'd gone with my then-husband, and it had been a long time since I had been touched by a woman, because I was in a monogamous, heterosexual-looking marriage, and yeah, I, I felt dumbfounded. I was like, oh, oh my gosh. I So in that moment, I actually don't even know. I think I kind of blacked out a minute. Um <laughs> I didn't know whether I, like, do I get to touch her? And I hadn't asked the right questions, so I didn't even know what happened next. Um, And I think she was incredibly caring and kind in that moment and, like, really just took care of me in in a really sweet way um, and left me feeling like I I was fine um, and I hadn't overstepped any boundaries. But I I do remember, like, reaching up and touching her arm because she had touched me. And later, when I learned more about consent, I realized, oh... Yeah, there were questions I could have asked. Right. And you can ask the question right can, there in the moment. Right, you can ask the question. And that's true of any erotic situation. Right. we got to use our communication. We've got to use our voices. And we've got to be courageous enough to ask the question that might feel right. like we can't ask it. So Elle gave us such a great perspective on all of that. Yeah. And, and more. And, and also, more. And also we got into some really important issues very important so i want everybody to buckle in for this episode yes. because we talked about sex work we talked about whore phobia um if you haven't heard that word before yeah get ready and get ready to possibly upgrade your language if um because yeah. and, and get ready to hear me make a big faux pas at the end of this episode it's okay to make a mistake it's okay and, if you catch yourself listening to this episode going whoa that is not how i have thought in the past and if you hear some of the things Elle says and think, uh, crap, and you shut down because you feel bad that you haven't behaved in ways that, well, at least 
one sex worker is saying, hey, that's that's not great. Remember that you're a learning human. You're a learning human and you can make that shift start right now. And so, uh, one of the great things about Elle is that they're constantly having this conversation out in public yeah. where we can have it because, and to your point about people like shutting down and feeling like they need to be, uh, you know, to already know, we haven't had the conversations out in public where people can learn about it. So right. that's one of the things we're doing is um, boosting Elle's voice. I, I hope so. And I hope everybody takes a listen doing. to this one. Pass this one to your friends. I think this yeah. is a this is a not to miss for anyone who in any way interacts with erotic labor, which means um, if you're an adult living in this culture, you do. We live in a culture in which erotic labor is demonized. So this is actually a must listen, even if you don't want to go to a strip club, even if you aren't sure how you feel about sex work, because legislation matters, who we vote for matters. Yes. And this is a life or death issue. For sex workers, this is a life or death issue. This is not to be taken lightly. So I really think this is, yeah, one for the books. Yep. So Ken, why don't you introduce Elle? To yeah. The so uh, Elle Stanger is an ASEC certified sex educator, as Jolie said, and a longtime adult industry worker and entertainer. Uh, Elle hosts They Talk Sex podcast and works in Portland, Oregon strip clubs and uh, behind paywalls on the internet. Yeah. So buckle She's, up, everybody. So yeah, enjoy the listen. Elle, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so glad to get to talk to you. Thank you for having me, Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken. (laughs) It's a total pleasure, not just because we are colleagues, um, but also because you are my favorite voice, our favorite voice on some issues that I think don't get talked about frequently enough. You are... I already said it in your intro, but you're an ASEC certified sex educator who is also a sex worker. Right. Like, this is not something we get to talk about frequently because of all the gatekeeping, but we're going to get into it today. I want to talk about your stuff, like what you bang a drum about so that our audience can learn from you because I know they're ready for it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you pointing out that I am certified and a longtime sex worker, because when I started training, I didn't even know if I would be able to get certified because I didn't know if they would discriminate or say it was unethical. Um, so I remember being in training and like starting, you know, when you get that like excited bubbling of ideas, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to one day be able to teach therapists and other educators about horophobia and the impacts of hatred or derision about sex workers or the work, the word horophobia, I just realized I used and like, didn't even introduce it. Cause I'm so used to talking about this stuff. So horophobia is the hatred or derision of sex workers or their related activities. Um, so yeah, thank, thank you, you for, for pointing that it. out. Yeah. yeah. And thank you for naming it. So horophobia uh, let's right off the bat. Let's just start by saying the audience probably listening has never heard that word because I mean, it's a word I only heard a couple of years ago and I've been doing sex ed for a long time. Mm-hmm. I it's think a word. it's, it's, so it's a word. I have a word for it. Yeah, definitely. And it's a word I only heard probably like six or seven years ago. And I've been a published nude model since 2005. So that's like 17 years now. And I've been dancing nude for 13 years as of June of this year. So it's really amazing. We're getting a lot better at having language in the last decade, I've noticed. There's the trick. If we have language for it, it can become something we talk about. And I am here for making everything talk aboutable. Mm-hmm. And when, when we when we talk about horophobia, I think it, we can't overlook how it has, it, it is just our culture. It's the water we swim in, in this particular American culture. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I want to just say, if somebody out there is thinking like, what the heck are they talking about? There's no horror phobia going on in my life. It's, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, just wait. Right. Yeah. It's so a part of the air we breathe and everything that you probably don't even notice it. Um, That's why it's so important to have a word for it, to, right. to have a word that encapsulates the things that people didn't even notice was happening. And mm-hmm. I, I would say sit with me and listen to any top 40 songs 
for half an hour or an hour or watch any TV, especially on heavy rotation. And I would be able to be like, poor phobia, poor phobia. <laughs> and I'll have some examples for you later if we want to go into it. Um, um, yeah. yeah, I think it's important to acknowledge that sex work has always existed. Even in bartering economies, I will argue it will always exist because people trade touch for other services all the time. Some people call it marriage. Some people, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have said time and time again, I would definitely give a hand job, you know, protected and consensual for someone to do my dishes sometimes because I just don't. I do that all the time. That is definitely <laughs> called marriage. Are that's you a, kidding me? That's an established. Um, that's, yeah. just standard. that's just standard issue. <laughs> so, but sex work is so more than hetero interactions. I have to say some of my most valuable interactions and clients were other female people, um, women, people who were transitioning, people who were experimenting with their queerness in a safe way for the first time. I've had so many women tell me like, wow, you, your breasts are the first I've ever touched besides my own. Yeah. Um, or, you know, also people that just needed some kind of transactional interaction where, for example, an example that I use um, is I had a client who had a partner that was dealing with some suicide ideation and actions. And then she did actually complete suicide. And I was the first person he told because he wasn't ready to tell his family. Oh, mm. yeah. Because yeah, he was worried about judgment. Intimacy. That's yeah. And that's transactional intimacy. It's kind of, you know, similar to when I tell my therapist all the things and then I pay her and then she wishes me well, and we plan to do this again. And then I leave, you know, I don't bother her like later in email. So transactional interactions happen all the time. And it's not just about obviously genitals. Um, and people do consent to transactional interactions all the time because it feels safer or it's, it's chosen. So I really, any listeners that have this knee jerk reaction to sex work and are in favor of trying to criminalize it or abolish it. Number one, please don't, because there's real value in these interactions. Um, and then number two, criminalizing or trying to abolish something actually just drives the workers deeper underground and makes police more likely to be able to arrest them, harass them, extort them. Anybody who was a history buff, think about prohibition in America, you know, a hundred years ago. Yeah. Where'd it go? <laughs> How well that went. Right. Or the war on drugs in the seventies. Let's heavily criminalize this. And it had the most impacts on poor people that were already marginalized. So, yeah. right. Anyway, and so thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I'm so grateful because this conversation can't happen without courageous people like you who are willing to not only do the work, but then come out and talk about it and deal with the fact that most of us, so I, I don't live in that world. And so I could just put blinders on. I could just pretend that it doesn't exist. You are standing in, in the crossfire as it were. And I really can't thank you enough because you open my eyes all the time to, oh, yep, that's whore phobia. Or how am I using my language in ways yes. that will harm others? Mm -hmm. Like some of what you're talking about, we don't have to, we don't have to even take a pro or con stance on things if we could just say, hey, I don't have to agree with everyone to let them live in peace, let mm -hmm. them be safe. Mm -hmm. So this can be really, really simple. If mm -hmm. you're not interested in sex work, cool. Then don't pay for sex. <laughs> don't, yes. don't, don't pay for sex. If you're not interested in sex work, don't watch porn. Right. A lot of people enjoy watching other people have sex. We find it stimulating and motivating and, you know, ideas and it's meant to be entertainment, but it can give you some ideas for practices you would like to try with your partner's consent or bring up, you know, um, but a lot of people forget that the people who made those videos were either doing it because they wanted to share creatively or they wanted to make money and or they wanted to do both. Um, some people go into porn because they see it as a reasonable, um, maybe attractive type of work they can do to lift themselves out of generational poverty. Right. I know and I work with a lot of people who started some of them started doing sex work when they were underage illegally whether that was a fake id at 17 working in the strip club or whether it was being unhoused and selling sex or hand jobs for rides or shelter 
Um, or it was someone, you know, as soon as they turned 18, like signed with the biggest porn production company and became a worldwide star for five years. Like, and a lot of these people, they wanted opportunity and they looked around and realized they were attractive enough to leverage what they look like. And also <laughs> some people can do amazing things with their body. So oh, yeah. some of the That's... porn I see, I'm like, I can't do that. I can't. Someone's like, do you do anal? And I'm like, uh, yeah, maybe like once every five years. Like, <laughs> Right. But <laughs> But let's, let's just say that's athletics. Yeah, I mean, right. so is pole dancing. So it's like, these are, these are athletic events and being able to do those things with your body, being able to do double penetration, like being, and, and, and then to sustain it for what it takes to shoot a scene. Mm-hmm. That is a feat. That is. Jesse Sage. Jesse Sage is a sex worker. I think she's sapio textual at Twitter and we don't know each other, but uh, she said something the other day about strippers being the athletes of the sex worker world. And I was like, thank you. Um, <laughs> porn stars a lot. Similarly, I, we could say the same. Um, I worked with a DJ who, it was so great of him. And I was actually, it's funny, I was driving, reflecting on this this morning. Cause I was like, man, I wonder where that DJ is now. Cause I miss them. But it happens quite commonly in the strip clubs that people, I will be watched by a hundred people an evening and make hardly any money because everyone's like, wow, you're so amazing, beautiful, strong, athletic, graceful. Uh, no, I don't have any ones. No, sorry. I just came in here to get a beer. Oh, you have to tip people. Strippers don't make hourly wages. Um, I don't want to make hourly wages. Personally, I don't want to be an employee of the venue. There's a lot of disadvantages for some people. And I won't go into that because that's a whole other like labor discussion. And some people might disagree or agree with me. But personally, I work for tips from people that want to be touched by me, talk to me, you know, laugh, joke with me, hug me, watch me dance. And some people will shell it out when they can afford it. But the problem is most people think all strippers make exorbitant amount of income, so they won't tip them at all. Or they'll do things like try to film us while we're working to show their friends, look, we're in a strip club. But So it gets really, really, yeah, it's really not cool. And it's really, it makes sense how plenty of my coworkers and myself might work a six hour shift and dance for dozens of people who compliment us over and over again. But I left with $20 two Tuesdays ago. Oh, two Tuesdays ago, people like this is, this is, is, I think this is a great conversation because we've talked about, um, um, you know, how to have a threesome, how to, how to schedule a sex party, but, a, mm-hmm. and even more straightforward. I want to have something more exciting in my partnership is let's go to a strip club together. Mm-hmm. Great. Let's do it. Well, let's mm-hmm. do it really well. So mm-hmm. I, how much money should someone go to the strip club with and like a really basic question? Thank you so much. So Classism aside, because you'll get people that'll be like, oh, don't go if you're not going to drop a bag and a bag is a thousand dollars. And I'm sorry, most of us, that's not in our budget. So I actually posed the question. I said, do I said strippers and clients, how do you feel like what's the minimum? And I would say a very comfortable answer was at least two hundred dollars. Yeah. If you're going to go to a strip club, especially as a couple, because first of all, figure out if there's a door entrance fee, some places it's a dollar, some places it's zero, some places might be 20 bucks. You know, the drinks could be $7. The drinks could be $30. Strip clubs right. vary quite a bit around the country, around the world. Um, and they are impacted by social attitudes and legislation, um, policing. So what else? Um, don't be afraid to ask and ask multiple staff like bartenders or bouncers, because let's be honest, some people are dishonest, but <laughs> it can be good to ask the folks who work here. Like what's common practice. Like if I sit at the stage, do I have to tip in some places? No, you're not supposed to actually, um, in Portland and in Oregon, it's completely the opposite. If you're sitting at the stage, please tip the dancer. Um, I had a group of five, six women. One of them is getting married. This was last Friday. Four of them sat at the stage and then the other two sat at the stage, but then they put their purses down in their chairs and went to go get drinks. And two other guys came up who wanted to tip me. And I was like, oh yeah, sit there, <laughs> move their purses. And some of the women were pissed. I got like $8 out of a group of six women who were there for 15 minutes. Yeah. I got $25. You're not off the hook. <laughs> You're not off the hook. You're not special. I'm working. Right. So, so understand that all of the people who showed up to dance, they probably number one are paying the venue to work there. 
Mm, we're probably paying they a safe that rental fee. Again. They're probably paying the venue to work there. So think of that. Like I have to pay a venue if I want to have a craft booth. <laughs> exactly. Holders. So yeah. So be serious about this. Like, of right. course we right. bring money to tip. <laughs> Right. If there's a general saying over here in Portland, uh, staring is stealing. So for example, I can still think of the one man who sat clutching his $2 um, PBR. He got three of them. He was there for six hours. Um, He didn't tip a single dollar because it's free dancing. It's free nudity to him. This is entirely unethical. It feels really gross. I feel exploited when people refuse to tip me, but they are determined to stare at my naked body dancing. It feels like shit. It feels like shit. Women do it all the time. People do it all the time. Women tend to do it more because they're like, I have a vagina. What's the difference? I've heard that on stage. Oh, I have a pussy too. So the DJ that I worked with that I forgot about, but he used to say, he said, if you can't do that, you should tip. There you go. It's like, wow, that's amazing. A dollar is nice. So please bring money. Um, Second big etiquette, please don't film or take pictures. It's actually a misdemeanor in a lot of states to record someone in a state of nudity or undress, whether or not you're planning on sharing that. Um, please don't post it on Snapchat or Instagram or you know whatever. This happens a lot. Um, please don't touch without asking. You might see it happening, but you don't know the relationships that those workers might have or just because you see it happening doesn't mean it's comfortable and welcome. Right. Um, I had a woman on my last shift. She was an elderly woman. She came in, looked around, wanted to ask me about my tattoos. I really don't want to have that conversation for the 800th time for free. So I evaded her a little bit. I said, I'm going on stage in a minute if you would like to watch me dance. She stood at the back of the room and watched me dance and she didn't give me any dollars. And then on the way out, she's like, okay, well, I'm leaving now. And I said, okay, have a good night. And she goes to just pet my arm. (laughs) Just just a little swipe. And I like moved out of the way because I was irritated. And she says, what? And I said, I'm sorry. I don't like being touched for free. Have a good night. She yeah. said, oh, okay. That was a very uncomfortable interaction. So thank you for asking. I hope people just learned a whole bunch of little nuggets of what to not do. Yeah. I, I just, I just, to, to sum up, I, I say this from my own perspective, just, I try to bring money to tip commensurate to how well I'm doing too. Like I'm yeah. having a, like, yeah. so I have a baseline that I will go with. And if I'm having a good week, so are you. <laughs> <laughs> there is no reason not to see this as a time to celebrate being alive together. Like this person is on stage dancing. I'm excited. We're in a state of euphoria. I think that is, I mean, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. It makes me so happy to get to share space with someone doing what, what they're capable of and that they'll let me enjoy it. Like, Mm, of course, bless you. We need those audience members. Yeah. We've talked about compersion. You've talked about compersion. I'm sure you know the word. (laughs) Yeah. I have to say, I, I experience that sometimes like third hand. I don't know what the term would be, but like, um, there was a a married woman couple a couple weeks ago and they got a couple songs for me. And I always ask couples in the beginning and strippers or sex workers or, you know, couples, this is a good one to remember, have an idea of who you want to be interacted with more with the provider. So I will ask people, am I splitting my attention 50, 50, or who should I focus on more? Love that. Right. Cause Love either that. the, the couple will be like, oh, we don't know. We didn't talk about this. Or they'll be like, eh, or 50, 50. Um, so that's a good way to kick it off. That's a really nice way for people to be accountable from the beginning. And that means all of us. So if I'm accidentally focusing way more time on one of the persons and I don't realize the other person's becoming steaming jealous because I didn't ask them where Mm -hmm. I should be, that's one way to avoid it. Um, but in this case, so I asked this lesbian couple, I think they said about 75, 25 at first, it was for the main, the main lady who followed me online. I believe they came in to see me, um, which can be really fun. I, I encourage listeners to come in and interact with me. Um, cause it'll feel just more positive for both of us. Um, and then after the first dance, the other wife was becoming more comfortable and aroused. And she said, 
She said, I have never seen you touch someone else, but I'm not even jealous right now. Like I actually really like this. I would, I, she said, I didn't think I would enjoy seeing you touch someone else so much. And so then I asked at the beginning of the second song, I said, are we still doing 50, 50 or, and she's like, no, you can come over a little more. <laughs> and felt, yeah, I felt their compersion. I, I felt it too. And I'm not even in their relationship. It was lovely. Yeah. There's yeah. the thing. I think we, we don't get to talk frequently enough about how transactional interactions can help us stretch our boundaries can help us play at the edges of what might feel okay or not okay. Yeah, I was I was thinking about the the transactional part of it. Like the transaction helps define and clarify the boundaries and if I go in and I don't pay any money, I can convince myself that like I'm not doing anything and I don't have to observe boundaries and but yep. as soon as you're like okay, here's money for what you're doing now, but but we had somebody has to make some kind of clear statement about what's happening right now right. Mm-hmm. versus just walking in is like, well, I'll just do whatever I want, whatever I want. No. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. Yeah. It's definitely a way for both people to be more accountable. And that can be very beneficial because it's like, mm. it's the line in the sand of, we understand like where this ends, hopefully. Yeah. Right. If the line wants to move, then the line can move. I mean, my daughter's dad, he was a customer of mine. <laughs> And well, I was like, it moved at some point. <laughs> yeah, it moved. I was like, huh, I don't think I want to charge this guy to interact with me anymore. I think I want to see him outside of work for free because I actually like him. Um, but then when he came into the club, he still wanted to visibly support me and also literally help me out. So he would still throw a few bucks or sit at my stage, but we wouldn't act like a couple because then that would help other people would be like, oh, something's happening over here. I should sit down. Or he'd point out like, oh, this person went to the ATM. Um, When we divorced, uh, he ended up dating another dancer. And he's really, really good at dating dancers. Uh, I raised him well. I love Um, that. (laughs) Thank you. And my second really, really significant partner, um, Brian, who is now deceased, he was also a customer of mine. Brian died by suicide a year and a half ago. So I'm still dealing with all the feelings. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, but Brian used to call me his dream girl because he had been jerking off to pictures of me since I was naked on the internet (laughs) and he was actually in high school. (laughs) Sure. I mean, high high schoolers get on the internet. I mean, I was looking at porn of adults when I was a teenager too. I was doing Mm -hmm. it playboy. Exactly. So, you know, teenagers have interests, but I, so the story was that he, um, had seen me online, you know, I wasn't the only girl I'm sure he was jerking it to a person, but which is great. And, but he recognized me. He's like, oh, that's model name. And he was a quiet, um, polite tipper for a few years until I noticed him. This was after my divorce. And I remember giving this guy dances and I thought, wow, he smells really good. (laughs) Like really good. Like, I think I want to like bend the rules here a little (laughs) (laughs) pro tip hygiene before the club, hygiene before the club. I mean, I then there's the magic fun. ingredient. I'm sure Brian smelled good to you specifically because yes. pheromones are real. Yeah. But also hygiene. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the other thing. Hygiene. You're not going to get a good dance if you went to like Burning Man and come turn covered in sand. Man. That's so, not the Yeah. Move. Someone did that to me once. They're like, I've been oh. in Bur- at Burning Man for 11 days and they were covered in sand. I was like, air dance, that's baby. Like, that's an injury <laughs> waiting to happen. <laughs> Yeah. Some people like construction workers will come in. They'll be like, just so you know, I might have fiberglass on these pants. And it's like, uh-huh. uh, I'm not grinding my Jiny on you now. Um, yeah. No, my no mom's thanks. pubis, if we're being um, specific. Right, really specific. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you for, yeah. Hygiene is a good one. Also and the touching I said earlier, ask before touching. Everyone has different touch boundaries. Of course. I worked in one club for about a decade where I didn't let people hardly touch me at all because that was the venue rules. And I wanted to be in line with the venue so I could continue working there and not piss people off or get fired. But I work in different venues now where more touching is allowed. So I have a client who touched my boobs for the first time in like a decade. (laughs) Of course, I charged a little more because you're getting more. Um, But, you know, every, every person is different. I just, just ask. And some people will be offended by the asking, unfortunately, and some people will not. Um, for yeah. example, if someone's like, can I touch your bush? You know, 10 years ago, I might've been like, no, but 
today, I don't think that's an unreasonable question because I do all types of work and how is this person going to assume my boundaries? So I, I like to say, ask, you know, obviously ask before touching. There's no guarantee your interactions might not be awkward, but I'm here to make them less awkward. Yeah, there's the thing. Practicing our words doesn't mean we won't be awkward. If you're awkward, though, you stand a chance of getting what you want. If you mm-hmm. if you aren't willing to brave that awkwardness, and mm-hmm. then you really can't. I As think, a lifetime awkward person, generally, <laughs> you are really I awkward. I can absolutely say that silent awkward is always 10 times as awkward as verbal awkwardness. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It helps to know ourselves. Yeah. Um, I want to before, I definitely want to follow your um, plans for the episode. I remember we mentioned some language examples. Yes. Um, and also, so there's two things. So media is really difficult for me to consume. Um, music can be really difficult for me to consume. It's really an interesting feeling being on stage and Mm -hmm. the person is singing about pimping out women or putting them on the corner. And I'm like, God, I like this tune, but not the words. Yeah. Um, I cannot stand Tina Fey. Tina Fey hates sex workers. If mm-hmm. you follow her writing and a lot of her entertainment, she always looks down on sexually prolific women. There's a lot of dead hooker jokes in 30 Rock. Um, I have a hard time. Yeah. So a lot of it is just really like, oh, you know, when I see examples of what seems really, really minute, but then it leads to things like sex workers losing custody of their children because they're perceived as ignorant or dangerous. Dangerous or damaging or something. Or damaging. Um, Or when I see and hear from other sex workers who, you know, people are fine to spend time with them and have sex with them and like ask for money, you know, date them, but not tell their family. Like, oh, my family won't let me marry a stripper. So this has to end. Or I don't think I could date someone in your lifestyle, but let's hang out all the time, you know, and I'll eat the food. Um, so some examples of language and horror phobia. So civilians, folks, friends, please stop using the word whore as an insult. You know, like, like you're yeah. acting Let's like a whore. Highlight this one because yeah. I actually have to remind my own teenagers. They're that like they have teenage banter, right? And yeah. so that is one of the things we'll hear just tossed around our house. And I'm a big fan yeah. of just like I don't know, swear, whatever. I don't care yeah, about that. Yeah, but Same. this we just had to have a conversation about this because I heard you say it. And I thought, oh, oh there's an example in right. my own house. I didn't catch it until I heard you say, like, it's not an insult. It's a job. It's not right, a right. It's like, so when we, when we make it an insult, we're right. like, what are we doing there? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so examples, yeah. Examples could be like, you're acting like a whore. You look like a whore. Go back to your home on whore Island, which is from that <laughs> silly, silly movie. Um, okay. So, right. So if there's nothing wrong with being a whore, why are we using it as an insult? Similarly, like when I was a kid, when I was growing up, that was definitely a common insult and we didn't even understand what it meant, you know? So I understand how that's still the case. Um, can't turn a hoe into a housewife. A lot of civilian women love to refer to themselves as hoes when what they actually mean is slut. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) let's embrace the word slut. Yeah, you're exactly. You're being slutty. You're being sexually prolific, but I think what happens is people, it feels exciting to feel naughty and counterculture, but if you're not actually a whore, like a person who works sex for money, if you're not someone who has ever sucked a dick for money, use a condom, by the way, the flavored ones, um, I don't refer to myself as a hooker because hooker is usually a term, a slur used for women that are socioeconomically on the bottom oh. and might be working outside. So street walkers. Yeah. Um, I have never worked outside and I have only straddled the poverty line and slept out of my car a couple of times. So I don't call myself a hooker. I call myself a whore. I don't call myself a hoe because I'm not a black sex worker specifically. There's a thing. There's a thing we can't that. overlook that, that like now we're doubly marginalizing people. Right or co-opting words that are being used by people who, right. who are using them for other things. Right. Um, 
Let's see what else. Um, yeah, the Ho, the Whore one is really interesting. I definitely, after the WAP song came out, Wet Ass Pussy, and it starts out, there's some whores in this house. Okay, so a lot of what they rap about, they're talking about sex that can be pleasurable, but it's also transactional. They're talking about the dudes they're fucking are giving them money, they're buying them shit. And a lot of relationships are like this. So, and there is a history of um, Black women talking about doing sex work to survive, and this lives in rap and it makes sense but when we see white civilians mimicking it mm -hmm. it's so cringe and the example is i go to my friend's house she works in like bitcoin i love her <laughs> but she's not a sex worker never has been she has a sign in her garden like it says there's some horrors in this house and i was like oh that's really sweet but number one that's not true right that's you and your daughter <laughs> <laughs> And number two, you couldn't actually put that on. I wouldn't put that on my door because that is a target on my back. And people right. do hate sex workers and they do seek them out and target them for violence or yeah. theft or harassment or extortion or outing. So those are just some examples where I think people don't really understand the gravity of the words they use. And then also they don't live with the discrimination that sex workers live might live with depending on what kind of work they do. So I'm only able to talk so much about my work and these issues because I'm a more privileged worker because I do mostly legal work in venues like strip clubs or hosted on websites that do all the proper verification. Um, so the big ones like Pornhub and Cam Soda and My Free Cams, um, you know, so like you have been are, able you've been able to leverage your privilege. In totally. order to do that. And, and, and then from there, what I watch you do, and the reason I respect your work so much is because I watch you use that to inform us <laughs> uh, so Good. about Good. like what's going on. And I don't want to leave this conversation without saying first, you just named a whole bunch of ways that actual horrors can be harmed if we don't watch our language. So yay. And there's an even bigger issue at hand all the time because the arguments around decriminalization versus mm. legalization versus mm. there, I know there are a million ways, this, the Nordic model, mm. there's so many ways to talk about what do we mm. do if we mm. do want to move away from the idea that, that transactional sex is bad. Mm -hmm. The next place people go usually is to, okay, we need to legalize it and regulate it. Mm -hmm. Tell us why that ain't the thing. <laughs> I love that you've been paying attention. I love that you're so um, up to up to snuff on on these issues. So, um, okay, so legalization will always create very strict regulations about who is allowed to do sex work, when, and where. And this can look like what it looks like in America is the brothels in a few of the least populated counties in Nevada. Um, these counties have legalized brothel keeping and working in brothels. So that means if you drive to the middle of the desert and you can afford to work in a brothel where they'll take like 40% of your earnings, mm -hmm. or you're a client that can afford to go there and pay probably thousands of dollars for it to be worth it to the workers and the venue, um, then you are not arrestable. If that structure is not in place, you're still arrestable. So that's why everyone else, everywhere else in Las Vegas, if you don't work in those brothels or go to them, you're still arrestable or subject to fines, harassment, being detained by police, being searched by police. And who do you think is very likely to be in danger of sexual assault when they don't have any legal recourse? It's people who are working sex on the streets, who are runaways, who are youth, who are trans, who are people of color who are sex workers doing it illegally that are absolutely not going to call 911 after they're raped by a police officer. Right. Ask for help. Right. So help with, no help. help with no help. Exactly. So legalization will put restrictions in place that some people will not be able to adhere to because of who they are. If I want to do sex work, if I meet a man in a bar and we talk for a while and like, he smells clean enough. And I take a peek at his ID and like his name matches what he told me. And, and he shows me, you know, that he does have the money and we agree to a rate and here's the place. And I text my friend and say, this is where I'm going. And yes, I'm going to use a condom and call me at this time. If I don't call you, 
Um, this is how I negotiated a way to make some money to feed myself for another week. And this is what people do. So if we are trying to prevent sexual exploitation, trafficking, coercion, it makes sense that we only arrest the people who ask for help. I was robbed. I was raped. You know, this guy assaulted me or he took the condom off, which in New Zealand is a crime. It's a crime, but not here. Only maybe parts Mm -hmm. in America. Yeah. Stealthing laws are just starting to come out. And we don't um, even know how to talk about it. So yeah, yeah. right. So legalization is not the path to harm reduction. Two years ago, uh, over 250 scientists from around the world who have studied the global impacts of sex work and criminalization made formal recommendations to Biden and Harris to fully decriminalize sex work in the United States, along with other recommendations. Full decriminalization means that people who are working sex or paying for it are not arrestable, but statutes and laws that pertain to force, fear, fraud, coercion, or interacting with minors would still maintain. Uh, New Zealand, uh, yeah, New Zealand did this in 2003 with the agreements that they would do follow-up studies on the impacts on public health overall. They found that the amount of sex workers stayed about the same. They reported the same reasons that they enjoyed working or chose it and that people working on the street or unsheltered actually went down. Let's underline that. Yeah. Let's underline that. New Zealand, yeah. New Zealand shifted to a decrim basis in, in 2003. 2003. That's almost mm-hmm. 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. They've done follow-up studies and those mm-hmm. follow-up studies have demonstrated that numbers of people working sex did not increase on the street, did not increase, Mm -hmm. nor did they decrease, but numbers of people being harmed decreased numbers of people being, or like, we're not seeing, we're not seeing the, the rampant uptick in. No, (laughs) no. Yeah. You never will. Rhode Island accidentally decriminalized for about 20 years um, in the 90s and the aughts. <laughs> oh, Rhode Island. They accidentally decriminalized and their reported assaults and um, measured STI rates went down also. So did decriminalization. They afterwards? They did. They, they went back and recriminalized it, even though public health impacts were better. So it's not debatable. It's not my opinion that decriminalization would be nice. It's been shown to have beneficial impacts. It's been recommended by literally over 250 scientists. There is testament in writing and podcast and TED Talk. Uh, Juno Mack, The Laws Sex Workers Really Want, is a great TED Talk. It's 17 minutes long. It explains from someone who's sold sex in plenty of different um, containers how different types of criminalization impacts people. And just because you mentioned it before, I want people to be very clear that any type of partial de- any type of partial criminalization, that means the Nordic model, the so-called end demand model, the Swedish model, um, the equality model, these all arrest clients. They all support the arrest of the buyers. And how do we as sex workers, number one, make money when you're arresting our clients? Number two, why are we spending public funds on arresting and punishing and outing and shaming people in some cases who were looking for transactional consensual touch when that money could be used for actual rescue, rehabilitation, rights, resources for people who need it and want it. Um, It just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't. It's just not a good way to spend our public funds. It's just not. I mean, I think Right off the bat, a nice comprehensive sex education program from K through 12 sounds like a great place to spend some of that money. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and when I think about decriminalization, I think, oh, um, we know a lot, of, a lot of our listeners understand that the war on drugs is a joke, that it did not yeah. work. You know, yeah, we live yeah. in Massachusetts where pot is now legal and we see exactly what is happening. And, and so the people that I interact with, they understand, oh, decriminalization makes sense in Mm -hmm. some circumstances and they haven't made the leap. I'm inviting you. Elle is inviting you. Ken is inviting you to make the leap, make the leap and understand that what we're talking about is harm reduction. reduction. That that's Mm -hmm. all this is like, if you want to like the logic works, 
the logic works. This isn't about an opinion anymore. And I really appreciate that you said that. This isn't your opinion. This is, we have the data. We don't need to wait. So exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. And what you said earlier too, if, if sex work is not for you, then don't watch porn, don't go to the strip club, but you know, I don't eat a lot of fried chicken. Um, so I just don't engage with fried chicken. I don't hate <laughs> fried chicken. <laughs> like, um, and also something else that it needs to be mentioned. A lot of the time, these partial criminalization models are proposed because they say it will rescue the workers or help the workers. But number one, that's not the case. We've shown that partial criminalization also can impact workers in really unexpected ways. And I'll give you a quick little example. If you criminalize third party facilitators, that's a really boring set of words. So if a third party facilitator of uh, some, okay. So if my landlord knows that I do illegal sex work, Uh they cannot rent to me. They might just not rent to me because if they know and they continue to rent to me, even if I'm not working out of my house, even if I'm working somewhere else, they have facilitated my prostitution according to some people and maybe the law. So this is a way that sex workers become unhoused. If my boyfriend or best friend, like I mentioned earlier, I might do a check-in and say, this is where I'm going. This is when I'll be back. If they pick me up or give me a ride, they've just facilitated prostitution. Oh, So any kind of partial criminalization is garbage. No Nordic model, no equality model. (laughs) It doesn't help people. This reminds me, I I, I, want to bring this up because it reminds me of something we talked about a lot in Massachusetts about, uh, well, about two decades ago, which is um, there were a bunch of us who were studying to be lay midwives, not certified nurse midwives, but lay midwives doing home births. And I, I wound up attending a bunch of births in Connecticut as a witness because Connecticut had decided to legalize home birth, which meant you had to have a certified person, which meant that all the lay midwives who had been delivering in Connecticut now couldn't. Couldn't, uh, Right. So now what was happening, people were having to make what was coming out enormous medical decisions based on a set of laws that didn't make any sense. And I wound up just being a witness. So I, instead of going into midwifery, I wound up staying a a witness for a while. So I would go and be the person who was just, no, I was here. She gave birth, no midwife. Wow. You know, we're fine. We're compliant. We're we're compliant because the midwives were at risk for being arrested, even when everything went perfectly. Wow. Even what a waste of money. Perfectly. What a waste, what a waste of, money of money and time mm-hmm. and energy and, and brains, because some of the most brilliant midwives I know got out of the business, got out of that line of work and, and stopped delivering babies healthily in this, in this wonderful model for the same reason, because it was just too risky to be that in that right. situation. And I, the reason I bring it up is because I know a bunch of our listeners we're part of that home birth movement that was happening in the late nineties, early two thousands. And we cared about this. If we cared about that, we should care about decriminalization of sex work. It's Absolutely. the same problem. It's right. the same problem. So. Right. right. Yeah. And if you, if it's what's going to help the most amount of people is decriminalization of sex work, because when I speak to survivors of trafficking, you know, they didn't want to report that they were being trafficked because they were afraid they would be arrestable. Um, even which, in, happens. which happens all the time in Alaska, you have to prove coercion of your trafficker. You have to prove it in order. Yeah. In order to be successful with that. There's only, I think Tara Burns is a great resource for information about this. She's a sex worker, writer, and researcher. Um, I know a woman, Amber Batts, uh, is her name. She's, she's out in media. She's been out in Alaska. She was convicted of sex trafficking herself. She was like 38 when she started working consensually. She was working with a couple other adults. She'd served five years prison time for working sex. Um, so what's going to help the most amount of people is full decriminalization. And when I've talked to people who were youth, this is what I was going to say earlier, they didn't report because their pimp told them, you know, who are they going to believe you or me? Like, I'll just say you're lying or whatever. Um, And if they happen to live in a state where you don't get arrested 
for working sex as a minor. So like Oregon in 2019 passed a safe harbor law where now if you're working sex and you report that someone's forcing you to do it, you're not arrestable. Even Which if you sounds like in- the bottom of the barrel, sorry, like, are you, I can't believe we had to pass a law for this, but okay. Yeah. Even if you live in a state where that's the case, where those provisions might exist, those safe harbor laws, a lot of people don't know they exist because why would you? Would you? And if, if you've been trafficked through other states or arrested in other states, why would you think anything is different? So um, the cupcakegirls.org is a really good resource too. They work with survivors of trafficking and sex workers. And they're one of the few organizations that will do that and won't actually ask sex workers to quit working in order for them to receive services. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of these religious nonprofits also, they'll say, well, in order to get things like, you know, like a gas card and money and groceries or transportation, you need to stop working in the club. Like we're not going to help you. If you stop right. until you stop, right. So just jump off the cliff. We promise yeah. we'll build you some wings sometime yeah. before maybe you hit ground or you'll bounce and we'll maybe help them. Porn but- abolitionists are a lot like anti-choice people where they're like, no, you need to have this baby. We're not going to help you take care of it, but like you need to do this thing. Right, yeah. do this thing. Yeah, just, just do the thing. So if we if we just get down to the centrality of de- full decriminalization helps the most number of people. Mm-hmm. And- <laughs> nothing about criminalizing helps decrease sex trafficking sex trafficking or it already would have fixed the problem like we exactly. don't we don't need to collect any more data we don't need to ruin any more lives to know it didn't work it's not yeah. working it doesn't work it doesn't um another resource before we go i mentioned earlier media um for people to really get an idea of how prevalent horophobia is and also how much they've been lied to in movies, I would recommend um, it's whoresonfilm.com. The director, Juliana Piccolo, she produced this wonderful film that just blew me away. Uh, Trigger warning, about 10 minutes in, there was about a minute of very violent movie scenes against sex workers, like just a collection of them. I almost had to leave the theater, but the movie itself is very, very valuable and a wonderful tool for teaching. Great. We'll make sure to get all the links, everything you've mentioned into the show notes so that people can access these as easily as possible. The more we can get our listeners access to what we can do to move forward toward decriminalization. Let's get that. Thank you. That means a lot because the opposition is strong and the opposition does not care about information because they really, really quite often just get icked out by the thought of people having sex or interacting sexually for money, especially if it's not heteronormative to make babies. Right. Um, if, if I could say one last thing, a lot of misinformation that exists about sex work and tries to link it to trafficking is done by fundamentalist religious conservatives who are anti queer, anti polyamorous and really, really want to abolish or criminalize sex work and want to punish the people that engage in it. And some of these people have the biggest names like Exodus Cry is one organization. They are not research-based. Um, they are run by a couple of folks that I just described. Um, and maintaining their image is very, very important to them because when you blow the lid off and start to expose these people, it blows their argument out of the water. Um, National Center on Sexual Exploitation or NCOSE.org. Um, that might not be the website actually, but NCOSE is what it's for short. Um, but National Center on Sexual Exploitation, they are also not research or fact-based. They were started in 1962 called Morality in Media, and they would put Bibles on people's doorsteps and warn about the horrors of porn. They found out that that wasn't working for them in the 90s, so they changed their name to sound like people who actually know what the fuck they're talking about. And they always marketing is everything. Conflate, marketing is everything. They'll always try to conflate sex work to sex trafficking. Yeah. Um, so it's frustrating. The battle feels very uphill. So thank yeah. you for all your support. Yeah. yeah, it's not a it's not a um, it's not a fight of persuasion. I mean, what I what I hear is that there you can't apply logic to the conversation. It's not a debate because it it's not a debate. It's not a uh, debate. Thank you. That's yeah, uh, and that's and something else. I, I appreciate this conversation uh, so much because 
for anybody who's feeling a little overwhelmed by, by like everything that they just heard. I I've been, I've been a sex educator for decades now, and it is still, I'm learning all the time, best mm -hmm. practices to help mm -hmm. my fellow humans. So it's okay to be learning this today and to change your behavior or change your mind about an organization or take a new look at, oh, maybe some of this stuff that I have thought was anti-trafficking is actually sex negative. Stop, full stop. It's just sex negative it and it's controlling and it's not going to help. And it's okay to just to be, <laughs> to be a contradiction and say, oh, you know what? I'm a hypocrite because now I changed my mind. Great be that lean yeah. into it. It's totally fine. And you can now take what you've learned and have a more nuanced conversation about how you want to be in the world everywhere from visiting a strip club to mm -hmm. how you interact with your legislation, how you interact with your friends and how you talk about whores and the great work that they do in the world. Exactly. And I'm letting you say whore now in this episode, but as we end a reminder to everyone to call us sex workers, yes. um, prostitutes is a legal term. And again, if a prostitute wants to call herself a prostitute, she gets to do that. It's the same person. A trans person can use any slur. They can re-empower it. Black people use the N word to re-empower it themselves. Like these words are very special to the people who live these identities. So we just ask that you respect them. Love it. So I'm going to model, model good practices here. I'm sorry. I didn't recognize that I was using that word wrong. Let's all respect how sex workers move in the world. Thank you, Julie, Dr. Julie Hamilton. You're so good at modeling. <laughs> That's it. Nice and simple. Thank you so much Thank for you joining so much. us. Elle. I want to say one last thing to our listeners, which is I've been fairly quiet during this episode because I am listening my ass off because I want to <laughs> get this. I want to, I, 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 I'm totally, I mean, I've been, I've been listening and um, watching what Elle has to say. It's all it's just been great. It's been great to talk to you. And yeah, I want to I want to hear more, and I want our listeners to know. Yeah, listen to this. This is, this matters a lot to a lot of people. And thank you. How can thank people you for hear your... more from you? Too? Oh, yeah. I please listen to my podcast. They talk sex. Uh, it's on Spotify. Kind of hard to find. Uh, <laughs> Apple yeah, Podcasts. You can find it. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll link it too. Thanks. Theytalksex.com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram. I'm not deactivated yet at stripper writer. When I started that account, I was mostly just stripping. Uh, now it would probably be Swerker writer. Um, I want to say thank you to your project relationship book because mm -hmm. after Brian died and I started dating again, it was, it was a rebuilding process and it still is. And my current lover partner is absolutely a totally different person than Brian was because obviously um, so it's been a little jarring for me to figure out what my new normal wants to be. And your book's been really helpful. So oh, thank you for the project that relationship. Means a lot to me. And yes. yeah, me I'm so glad you're in the world. Me too. You too. <laughs> Total love fest. Thank you so much fest. for joining us. Thank you, Ken and Jolie. Thank you, Elle. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. I have one more thing to share with you. If you want to pop over to listen to Jolie.com, that's just listen to Jolie, J O L I.com, you can grab my top five relationship guides for free right now. Yeah, get the guides. They're easy to implement conversations that will empower you to create the love you want. It's my mission to make everything talk aboutable sex, love, losses, and learns. Everything is talk aboutable. <laughs> She managed to help me be able to talk about stuff that I once couldn't even imagine saying out loud. Now I speak openly with my lovers, my friends, my family, and you all on a podcast, out loud. Relationship work really can change everything. So when you're feeling the rough edges, when things aren't going the way you'd hoped, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news. 